Managing change. In today's world, this is a huge thing that needs to be conquered. Change in organizations. When we think about change, sometimes we plan something. We know it's going to change, and, and it's deliberate decisions. Other times, and in many cases, you can't always direct or plan life. It just happens. So the change has been imposed and often unforeseen. <clears throat> Excuse me. External forces on change. Globalization. That's a huge one. Workforce diversity, which is growing as our prior chapters have discussed. Technological change. It's literally daily. And ethical behavior with the causes of those that had created some scandals prior to now. Globalization and change. Globalization in an organization, you want to use resources, get that information out there, deliver people, and it does usually require structural changes and the minds of employees will change. Workforce diversity. Interesting information, majority of new workers will be female. We will grow in cultural diversity, which I think a lot of us have experienced. And as we know, um, a lot of our workforce is aging. Ethical behavior. When we change, we want it to be ethically towards other organizations, our customers, society, and our environment. Internal forces. The four items below, declining effectiveness, crisis, changing employees' expectations, and changing work climate, all of those are internal forces that promote and cause change. Okay, when you think of the scope of change, and headlining this with change is inevitable, there's incremental change, which are smaller, strategic, where you're making a business decision to make a change, and it's controlled, and then transformational change tends to be more radical. Um, something with sometimes an unknown future, but it's, it's really um, a huge change, a radical change. Change agents. These are people or groups that kind of undertake and oversee starting and managing this change. And your effective change leaders will build relationships. Some common um, definitions of a change agent, they tend to be young, female, flexible, people-oriented, a tough decision maker, focuses on performance, energizes, uses different leadership styles when appropriate, and is okay with ambiguity. Let's talk about the types of change agents. Internal change, ag change agents. The advantage is they're familiar. They know what's going on in the company. And they have to stay and live with the results. The disadvantage, and this came up in places like General Motors, where there was just so much familiarity, they didn't know how to break out of the box. And being too close can also make you less subjective as not so much objective. Internal agents, which I've experienced in my work life, they definitely have an outsider's objective view. But they are going on a narrow view of the organization history, and they don't live with the changes. You do. External agents, to be effective, to have their power in the right way, needs to be perceived as trustworthy by the organization clientele, the ex have expertise, have some credibility and track record, 
and be somewhat similar to the employees so that there's a relatable situation. Resistance to change. There's numerous ways we all resist change. We don't know what's coming. We're going to lose something, maybe our status. We're not going to measure up. Um, maybe that technology is going to take us away from talking to people we want to talk to. Personalities. If you have an internal locus control and positive, you tend to be more acceptable of the changes that come. Politics. Um, somebody in power is no longer in power. Maybe your mentor. And there are certain cultural assumptions and values that sometimes are difficult, like cultures that don't want to tolerate ambiguity. How do you manage that resistance? Communication is key. Talk about what's changing, why it's changing, ask for their help, and understand and be empathetic. The next two slides are not in your book. Some specific types of change reducing resistance. This chart takes each one of them, education and communication, participation, facilitation and support, negotiation, manipulation and co-opation, and coercion. Kind of gives the example of when change going on, how do you handle it, and why it works, and sometimes why it's not the best choice. How do people react to the change behaviorally? Some withdraw. Some feel that um, they're so connected to the old process that they're going to lose their status. We're all in situations where people complain about all the sorts of things going on, like Obamacare's conversations. And then there's those that are just kind of lost. They're not really sure what to do with the change, so they keep trying to learn and just feel frustrated. So what can the managers, what can the organization do to help with these type of behavioral reactions? Talk to them. Try and bring them out. Disidentification. Encourage them to take what they know and apply it to the new um, changes. Let them vent and try and work with them to support that change. And help as much as possible to clarify that frustration and ambiguity. When we think about change, Lewin um, did a study about the force field analysis. And this example in your book talks about wanting to lose weight or get healthier. So you've got these things that want you to change, like you're feeling lethargic, um, your new job's demanding. And then you have these other forces that say, I'm tired, I don't want to do it, my um, partner doesn't care about doing it, and they push against each other. And whichever one wins tends to be what happens. So Lewin had this situation where there's forces to change the status quo. As you're moving, you're developing these new things, and you eventually get to that new attitude and behavior. Unfreezing eliminates rewards for current behavior, changes things up, starts putting in those new initiatives, and eventually it'll quote unquote refreeze into that new behavior. This also is not in your book, but it's a good visual where you can see that change over time from the triangle to the circle. Organizational development. This is a systematic approach to try and work with the organization for improvement. It can be especially helpful in times of change. It uses behavioral science theory and research, and it is for the overall 
positiveness of the organization. So the organizational development cycle starts with diagnosing the needs and analyzing. Intervention, looking at what's going on with it and some follow-up. So how am I going to diagnose? Where's the problems? What have we done about it? And this can be that initiation for change. So you understand the situation, look at some data, interpret some of the attitudes, relationships, and how the organization works, and look and draw some conclusions. So now the intervention methods. You can use surveys, management by objectives from our prior chapter, MBO, have quality programs in place, team building situations, Bring in a process consultant. Okay, if I look at the survey, we're looking at questionnaires, and it's fed back to the employer. Um, many of us have done these, and sometimes we may or may not do them as effectively as we could for various reasons. Management by objectives where you're setting things together. Um, put the joint goals in place, take a periodic review, and you continue to reach and go towards those goals. Quality programs. Um, there's many companies now that have all sorts of quality programs that help for positive change. And team building. Um, some groups will go off into the woods and, and start um, falling into each other's arms to see that that trust is there. Team building exercises. Process consultant, somebody who comes in, defines, chooses an approach, gets that data, diagnoses, intervenes, and then leaves. Some individual methods offer skills training, leader development, executive coaching, role negotiation, job design, health promotion, and career planning. And all those many of you may have had opportunities in your organizations to do. I know in my past work experiences I've done several of those. Skills training. Getting the people trained to do what they need to do and do it well. Leadership training and development, that's where you're looking at all sorts of enhancements to improve the leadership in your company. Executive coaching. Renegotiating the roles. Changing or redesigning the job for a better and improvement. Many companies have health promotion programs and career planning to work with them to map out a career. When you use organizational development, we have to keep ethics in mind. When you think about it, there can be ethical issues where organizational development is maybe not properly using their ethics. So you have to be careful of the selection method. You want somebody that really understands the selection method. It should be voluntary. You don't force someone into any of the organizational development um, methods of intervention. It should be confidential. And you don't want a change agent that can manipulate how things should occur in that development or change in the organization. So managing change, understand what forces are out there that causes change, develop a shared vision, Visibly demonstrate that support for the change. As a leader, show that you're behind it. Um, make sure you're looking at everything. Big one. Make sure you have the right resources, people, money, equipment, etc. to really make the change happen effectively. Plan and manage for resistance to change. It will be there. And select the organizational development techniques that will meet what you need. And when you do choose them, manage them ethically. 